Our next storyteller is David Novak. Somebody said to me at supper time, they said, I saw David last night tell to mostly adult audience and he did, you know, stuff for big brain people. They said, but earlier in the day, he worked with 150 kindergartners and they all sat there like. <laughs> so he's like a chameleon. He can do that. So now we're going to see him in yet another genre in the ghost genre. He's raised teenagers and has a five-year-old. He knows horror firsthand. <laughs> Mr. David Novak. Oh boy, when people ask you to tell, tell them a scary story, you don't understand how complicated a question that is. I mean, what scares you, right? You know, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the dark in my closet. Now I'm afraid of the dark in myself. And when I had children, well, the things that scared me changed radically, right? You know, it's uh, starting to get a little cool. Um, we had a breeze coming through here, nice and good and moody. I think something that always goes with uh, ghost stories real well, especially at the night time like this, when we're in a tent, <laughs> is a fire. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have a fire in here? I think so. They won't let me do it, of course. <laughs> but maybe with your help, we can create what I'll call a storyteller's fire. Now, you know, you're going to build up a good fire, a good campfire for storytelling around it. You need to gather up different kinds of wood. First, you want to go around, you want to gather up twigs that are tiny and dry and brittle so they'll catch fire quickly. You don't want to put green wood on a fire. So you gather up a nest of twigs. And then on top of those twigs, you're going to take some branches, a little heftier, and lace them back and forth. And then on top of those branches, a nice seasoned log. It'll burn for all our storytelling time. So our fire can now grow from the twigs through the branches to the log. I guess like a good story from the beginning through the middle to the end. All we need to do to get that fire started is to strike a match. And drop it among the twigs. Then listen. The first sound you hear will come from the twigs as they start to This is where you can help me out. That's it. Look. Now you can hear how fast the fire will spread. So you gotta be careful with fire, especially when you grow oak trees like this. Well, those twigs, they snap like that and they begin to heat up the branches. Now, when the branches get hot, they're gonna make a sound like this. Make a hollow cup-like shape with one hand. With the other hand, you're gonna play it like a, like a drum. You know? like a... Now we're gonna mix it together. Twigs, branches. Yeah, now that fire's crackling along, and it's heating up the log. And when the log gets hot, it's really going to start to get. Now let's mix it all together. Twigs, branches, log. Right. Now you can hear that fire crackling, popping, and getting hotter. Come on now, and blaze louder. Come on now, everybody else, come on And the flames get up there. They get up, they get up, they get up, and then hold your hands up. Now our hands are good and warm by that fire. That summer my mama finished her master's degree in Columbia. Daddy got us a cabin in the woods. Because mama wanted to get away from it all. I mean, away from it all. And we were away. We were far away. There were no cars and trucks and motorcycles buzzing past. There were no planes landing overhead. There were no electric wires and street lights. There were no telephones and no television. Only a cabin and water. A lake. 
And when it got dark, it got dark. And when it got dark, there was creaking, chittering, chirping, buzzing, and the lapping of water. And there was biting. No see -ems is what Dad called them. Oh, and he was right. You couldn't see him, But boy, oh, you could feel them. They really bit and they really hurt. <clears throat> so Dad built us a fire to keep away the no see -ems, he said. And it was a brash, clumsy city man's fire, belching flames and sparks up into the air, loud, brash, splashy, big flames with this glowing golden Aladdin's cave at its heart. And we sat up close to that fire, wrapped in that smoke. And Daddy told us a story. He said it was an Indian story. But uh, he didn't know anything about the Indians, so we knew he was making it up. We didn't know anything about the Indians either, so we let him go. He said, once there was a hunter, a brave, Dad called him. It was in the long ago, and he was a good hunter. He hunted with a sharp stone knife. And he would hunt by standing still. He would go where the animals would go to rub against the bark of a tree or to browse the berries of a bush. And he would stand still until he was as if a piece of the forest, a part of the woods. And the animals would come close and closer and he would grip his stone knife. And when they got close enough, he would stab and take. And in this way, he was a hunter. And he was a good hunter. And he brought good food to the village, to the people. But one winter came early and hit hard and stayed long. And the food dwindled and still the winter persisted and the hunter went to get more food in the cold in the bare woods. And he stood in the cold in the bare woods and he waited and the cold froze the stone in his grasp, froze the bone in his flesh, and the cold froze his heart and turned it and twisted it. And in his hunger, he thought, I, I must hunt my own kind. And he thought, I will be like wolf. Wolf is good for the herd, for he hunts only the very, very young, the weak, and the old, and so the strong survive. I will be like Wolf. But he did not let himself think that Wolf never hunts his own kind. He did not let himself think that. And so, in the night, he stood still. And he was still as the wood and still as the night. And the old ones began to disappear. And still he walked in the night and stood in the night so that the light of the day hurt him and he hid from it. And he embraced the dark and became a thing of the dark. And at night the people would hear a baby cry. And they would think, oh, he's hungry. And then the crying would stop. And they would think, hmm, he's feeding. And the young ones began to disappear. And the people began to see that there was something unseen that was attacking the people. Something in the dark was taking the people. So the people made war against the dark. And they made a circle. 
And at the center of the circle, they put the very old, the very young, the weak, and the lame. And all around the outside of the circle, they put the very strong. And then they built a fire. And with that fire, they attacked the thing that walked in the dark. They attacked the dark itself. And the sparks from that fire rose up and went out into the dark and spread the fire, took the fire with them, lighting the dry wood, the bare wood in the cold night. And that hunter fled from the light and ran from the fire and he ran from the flame and he ran from the sparks till he came to the edge of the water. And then he saw his reflection with the flames approaching from behind, before him on the water, still water, he saw his cold reflection. He saw his face, his hands. He saw the blood of his people upon him. And the fire touched him and made a flame of him. And he screamed, and his screams, they say, were the screams of a man who saw the monster he had become. And he threw himself aflame into the waters, and he fell into the waters, hissing and popping and bubbling down. <coughs> but he could not cross over, Daddy said. He could not cross over. So he came back. He became the no <laughs> Still, he hunts with his sharp knife. And still, he seeks to eat the blood of the people. But Daddy said, this, the fire remembers him. And the sparks remember him, for the sparks became the fireflies. And still, they guard the dark. And they guard the people. And he said, we, the people, we must always remember to make a circle. And in the center of the circle, we must put the old, the young, the weak, and the lame. And all around the edge of that circle, we must put the strongest of our numbers. And then Daddy put some more wood upon his fire, and it belched more sparks into the night, and we watched those sparks go into the dark. And we looked into the dark. And Daddy said, why are we afraid of the dark? Is there something there? Yes, he said. The dark is there. And the dark is where we put everything we do not want to look at. And then he got out some marshmallows. <laughs> And he whittled some sticks. And we sat in the dark by the fire with the sparks above and the glowing caves below. And we watched our marshmallows roast from white to brown to black, hissing and popping like bones. Maybe that's the answer to the question I was pondering at the very beginning. What is it that we are afraid of? Well, it's always different. It's very personal, very private. But maybe we could just simply sum it up as the dark. But where is the dark? The dark was all around me as a boy. I had, uh, as a child, I had petty mal seizures mild form of epilepsy. My mom and my mother took me to the doctor, you know, and they put that, uh, those electrodes on my, all around my head, and they did EEGs, and they looked at the various odd blips that came out of my brain waves, and they went, hmm, ha, oh, ha, ah, hmm, he'll outgrow it. And it's kind of how they dealt with that then. Um, 
My mom explained to me, you know, petty mal, it's French. It just means little sickness. You're just a little sick. But uh, when I studied French in high school, I discovered that petit mal means little evil. Mal. Malady. Malice. Malevolence. But as a boy, the dark was palpable. It was a tangible presence in my room. And for me, dark was not the absence of light. It was the presence of something. I would lie in bed, and I would feel a, feel a chill run up and down my spine, I, and I'd, I'd feel a, a clamminess, and I'd, I'd feel a stiffness, and an, uh, and an inability to move. I would feel clamped down and the dark would begin to shape itself around me. And out of the dark would, would come these silhouettes, these dark figures that would gather all around me and they would reach down and the dark would reach into my flesh and grab hold of my bones and it would pull and shake and pull and shake and pull as if it was trying to rip my soul out of my skin. And there was nothing I could do but clamp down as tight as possible and hold on and hold to myself and hold to the bed until they relented and retreated. I call them the grabbers. Mom, the grabbers came to get me. And I always knew when they were coming because I could feel that chill. But one night, I was about six years old, very early in the morning, I began to feel that chill upon me. I opened my eyes, but I knew I could not move. I could not lift my leg. I could not lift my arm. But I could just barely turn my head as I looked out from my bed. And there, beside my bed, was a dog, a great black dog, staring fixedly at me, looking at me with that hunting stare, holding his gaze on me and I felt as if the dog was warning me not to move, not to rise, not to go, that there was danger in leaving. He was keeping me in a way, in my place. And beyond that dog, I saw them, the grabbers, materializing out of the darkness and approaching near and nearer, but they stopped, for they would not cross the threshold where the dog was watching me. And I knew that that dog, for all of its phantom fierceness, was a guardian and was protecting me. And from that point on, the grabbers became less and less frequent. And I always had that sense that there was this phantom dog out there walking the threshold back and forth between their world and mine, watching over me, watching out for them. Throughout world folklore and mythology, we find dogs as threshold guardians. I find that interesting. The three-headed dog of ancient Hades in the Greek myths, Cerberus, right? Better known to modern audiences as Fluffy. <laughs> I always thought when I first learned the Greek myths that Cerberus, the three-headed dog guardian of the gates of Hades, the land of the dead, the realm of the spirits, was there like a jailer to keep the dead in the land of the dead. But he had his extra heads for extra reasons. He was not merely there to keep those who were imprisoned in that realm there within, but he was also to keep those who did not belong there out. His job was to keep the living out, you see. Because they say that in our dreams, our spirit wanders often the same paths as the spirits of the dead. And we can become lost and we can, can become confused and we can stray into the land of the dead. And the dog is there to keep us out. 
until it's our time, you see. The Egyptians, of course, had Anubis, the jackal-headed, dog-headed god who is also the threshold guardian into the realm of the dead. The Mayans say that the dog carries the spirit of the dead over the waters of oblivion. Joseph Bruchak, a Abenaki storyteller up in upstate New York, tells me that the Iroquois have a tradition that uh, a hunter's dogs will greet him when he goes into the realm of the dead. They will be on the far side of the chasm that separates the living from the dead. And over that chasm stretches a log, unevenly balanced. And the spirit of the hunter must cross that log. And if he was good to his dogs, they will hold the log steady so that he can cross over. But if he was not good to his dogs, they will tip it as he is crossing and he will fall into the abyss. Hmm. The church grim in the UK, you may have also come across that in Harry Potter. Right? Sirius Black, Sirius the dog star, of course. The church grim was the spirit of the dogs that guarded the graves. There was a tradition that the first uh, life that was buried in a cemetery was responsible, its spirit was responsible for guarding the cemetery. So they would kill a dog and bury him at the beginning of a new cemetery and that dog spirit then would remain as the grim. They could sometimes be friendly and help wayfarers who were lost in the night find their way and sometimes could be a terror to those who meant evil. Hmm. When my son Jack was six years old, he came to me early one morning and he said, there was a dog in my room last night. My wife said, that was just a dream. But I knew better. And I was relieved. I knew he would be all right. Well, that petty mall, I pretty much outgrew it, I think. <laughs> it came with a, another phenomenon they call absence seizures, in which I would just sometimes be <laughs> absent. But if I get really exhausted, terribly jet-lagged perhaps, or sick, you know, have a fever, it can maybe break whatever controls I've developed over time and make me vulnerable to that falling sickness. I was in Providence, Rhode Island, and I'd been overworked and exhausted and kind of had that falling sickness and had gone absent. I don't know for how long. I was on the northwest side of town, a hilly area that could look down on the valley below. So I, I got up and I went to one of the uh, neighborhood taverns that I like to visit. The view from the door looked down into the town and out to the water. And I, I went up to the tavern and I stepped over the barkeep's dog, Max, who was always lying across the threshold of the door. Like he was, and looking out, you know, like he was waiting for the rest of his party to arrive. <laughs> I went in there, it was a cozy, old, wooden room with little, you know, shiny wooden booths and a, kind of an amber glow about it. I felt like a fly in amber and I got myself my single malt. I sat down there nursing my spirit. Looking out the window, looking into the night and the city lights. When the light went out, not down but out, for in the doorway I saw him, old, cold, 
Mr. Grimm. Death had made an appearance in our tavern. So I motioned him over and invited him to have a drink with me. <laughs> spirits for spirits, after all. I got another shot. I got a bottle. Poured him a shot and myself one. He seemed surprised that I saw him there, but you know, once the veil is torn, you can never stitch it back perfect. So he sat across from me, and we drank a toast to nothing. It's a good toast when you're drinking with death. <laughs> And we threw back our shots, he put his glass down, it was all frosted and full of fog. And I said to him, So, is this it? Have you come for me now? Is it my time to walk in your shadow? And he said, I don't know. I said, but your death, right? The great reaper, the end of the road, the last syllable of recorded time. He said, yeah. So I said, is it my time? Is it my death tonight? He said, how should I know? I'm just a force of nature. I go around, I have no idea whether it's your time or not. What do you mean, you think I keep a day timer? <laughs> you people are so obsessed with what's happening now, what's happening next, and you're keeping track of things, keeping time with things. You know, it just happens. I wander around and I don't know why, I don't know why, where I'm going most of the time. I don't know what reason brought me here, what reason will take me away. All I know is that as I go, somehow or other, my job is getting done, so I don't worry about it. Pour us each another shot. And I thought, how do I always get into these conversations? <laughs> he said, you know, you go around, you do what you do, you keep yourself busy, you keep yourself so busy. Maybe you just don't like paying attention when there's nothing to do. So you you know, what do you do? You go to the grocery store, you buy something, you go to the bank, you pay for something, you go uh, get the mail, you know. You do what you do, right? Keeps you busy, but that's not really what you're doing. That's not really what you're here to do. But it doesn't matter, because you're doing what you need to do, that's why you're you. Take my friend, the ocean. You'd like this guy, restless. He's always everywhere, busy, keeps himself busy all the time. He's always like, you know, calving glaciers or eroding coastline or sinking ships, you know. But that's not really what he's to do. That's just what keeps him busy. But what he's doing is getting done. That's why he's the ocean. I felt it was time for another <laughs> toast to nothing. And he said, you know, it's, uh, you storytellers give us all a lot of trouble, though. I mean, I am a force of nature, right? But you, you guys, you have to go out and anthropomorphize everything. Yeah. And then you go and tell stories about me. Get people all worked up, right? Like, uh, you know, take that one in which I'm supposed to be a godfather, all right? I'm sure you told that story once or twice where uh, the poor man has a son and he's looking for a godfather for his son, but he refuses God because he does not treat people fairly. He refuses the devils on the same ground, but he sees me and so he asks me to be the godfather of his son because I treat all equally. So, according to the story, I agree, all right, whatever. I take this kid on, you know, as my sort of apprentice, and I teach him how to know me. Huh? And I teach him, uh, how's your story go, uh, that uh, if anybody is sick and dying and uh, I'm standing at the head of the bed, there's no hope for them, they must die, they must go with me. But if I'm standing at the foot of the bed, there's a chance that they might recover, right? And with this knowledge, my godson goes on and becomes a great healer. 
Because everywhere he goes to tend the sick, he sees me either standing at the head of the bed or the foot of the bed, and he's able to save these people that are savable, and he becomes famous for this. I mean, come on. As if people only ever die in bed. <laughs> but you know, that's the way you storytellers would have it, right? Just keep it simple. So, of course, he goes on and becomes famous. The king's daughter, the princess, you know, she gets sick. And he's called for. He comes into the room, and there I am, supposedly standing now at the head of the at, at the head of the bed. You know, he sees me there. He realizes, oh my gosh, you know, she's got to die. But but he looks at her, and of course, he falls in love with her. He doesn't want her to die. So what does he do? He turns the bed around. <laughs> so okay, she survives, and it's, supposedly I take him down into my cavernous home, my lair in the underworld. And I explain to him about the way death is supposed to work, and I show him this infinitude of candles, some newly lit and some sputtering out in their wax. And I explain to them that each of these candles is the measured life of every human spirit, and that he must not take out any life before its time, and he must not prolong any life after its time. I mean, as if I want to take care of all those candles. <laughs> I mean, you know why it's candles, right? Because back when people were first telling the story, that's how they told time. They'd light a candle and they'd say, oh, what time is it? I don't know, it's uh, one notch past the first notch there. It's, uh, how much more time have we got? We got, I don't know, what, uh, 10 notches left, you know? As if they couldn't tell time with their own eyes, their own ears, their own heartbeats. But that's, that's you guys. That's the way people are. You know what the story would be today if it was being made up today, you know? It'd be a cavern full of digital clocks. <laughs> but there's no notches on a digital clock. There's just, you know, point oh nine, point ten, point fifty, point oh oh, point oh one. It goes over and around and it just never stops. It's just an ongoing, ongoing. hit me. The poor son of the drink. He knocks back in the shot. The glass is still frosty. You know, I'm the favorite straw man for every politics saint. I mean, everybody who wants to put themselves up as the great savior makes a campaign promise that they will conquer death that they will get rid of me, right? They go away, you know, they go up in the mountain, down in the cave, off in the desert, and then they come back after a long time and they proclaim that they have found me and conquered me and that if everybody follows them and do what they are told to do and act like they're told to act, when they die, they won't be dead. Figure that one out, because I can't. <laughs> We sat there in silence. He said, well, thanks. He pushed away from the table. He said, I think I'm gonna go downtown. There's some action in the traffic. <laughs> Maybe that's where I'm supposed to be tonight. He got up to walk away. I said, but wait, wait, whoa, wait, wait, wait. I still don't get, I mean, am I supposed to, am I supposed to come with you? He said, suit yourself. <laughs> you can come with me now if you want. If not, I'll see you later. <laughs> so I thought about it, you know. I thought, to be or not to be? That is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more. Well, I mean, by a sleep to say, we end the heartache,
I decided to be. And he walked away. And as he crossed the door, the barkeep's old dog, Max, shuddered, groaned, and fell limp. His party had come around at last. Thanks for being here. <laughs>